start our first talk. It is with great pleasure that I introduce to you guys Roman Tunes, uh, expert software engineer specialized in .NET technologies. He will be presenting to us the talk. Oops, I did it again. I hope you like it. Thank you. Thanks for the invite. I'm a bit of a low talker, so if you can't hear me back there, please raise your hand. So the talk, as Daniela mentioned, it's, oops, I did it again, which was helpful from JetBrains to improve my name because the original name was untangling the mess we're making out of OOP. So just in 15 seconds, I'm John Tunj. I'm from Portugal. This is more relevant when I'm presenting to foreigners. Uh, I'm a software architect at OpenVIA Mobility, and I'm a Microsoft MVP in developer technologies, which basically just means I'm all this yapping about C Sharp and .NET and stuff. So let's get to what's relevant. So I am going to talk basically about object-oriented programming because it's at least still the most broadly used programming paradigm. But my question is, are we really doing object-oriented? Because I'd argue most of the object-oriented code that we see is actually procedural. Or maybe you have been luckier, but my experience in the projects I've been working on is this one. So this presentation has a couple of goals, which is to remember the basics of object-oriented and also other paradigms. So I'm not just going to focus on this, although it's the main focus, but I'll also put some procedural and functional in between. It's not the goal to show the one true way. These are just some ideas to hopefully help you improve some object-oriented code, but they're ideas. Maybe they make sense in some cases, they don't make sense in another. And I also, of course, don't want to start a paradigm flame war like object-oriented versus functional, because as I mentioned, I'll be using both in the, in the same code. So quick overview of the presentation. I have these topics, which you will not understand the title right now, but hopefully you'll understand later, which is the super controller, the super service, individual request handlers, OOEFying, which is not really a word, but let's pretend it is, make use of type safety, and minimizing exceptions. So because we like samples to understand the things we're talking about, the sample will be a supermarket API, which kind kind of silly, but whatever. I think it will be good enough for everyone to understand what I'm talking about. And it will have some common cart operations, like create a cart, get the information from an existing cart, add item to cart, update an item in cart, and remove an item from cart. But because this is a lot, we'll focus more on just one, which is add item to cart. So let's start with the super controller. And let's look at code. So most of the presentation will be code. So the super controller, and I think you'll now understand why I call it the, the super controller. It's because it does everything. Uh, so of course, if you are not really web developers or API developers, maybe you don't really understand everything, like what's a controller. So basically, a controller is something that we use in ASP.NET to, to register the endpoints that will handle the requests that will be made to an API. In this case, because it's an API, if it was a website, it will be for pages. But in this case, for the API, we have the controller, and we have action methods which, which will implement the, the endpoints. So we have a cart controller, which has all the logic for everything that we do to carts. So we have a method uh, to get an item from, we get the item from the repository and return it. We then have a create cart. We have an add item to cart, which is where we have a bunch more logic. Like uh, we start by logging, just to know that we started handling the, that request. We have some basic validations, which normally in ASP.NET are done in other ways, like with attributes and stuff like that. But it's a demo, so I use the, the most basic way of doing it. Then we finally, passing the basic validations, we get the item, the, the cart from the repository. We get the, the item from the repository, which means repository is just an abstraction from the database. And then we check that the, the item exists. Uh, and if, if it exists already in the cart, because if it's in the cart, we don't want to add the item again to the cart. So we validate that. Then we have a couple other business logic validations, 
which again are probably a bit silly, but it's what I remember to use as an example, like maybe a product you can only buy so much of that, so much quantity of that product, so we need to validate that. Or, for example, you can, can only buy a certain product at a certain time of day. So, for example, maybe the store doesn't want drunk people in the morning, so they only start selling beer after midday, for example. Then we have some more logging. And finally, because we passed all the basic validations and the business validations, now we actually put the item in the cart. And because I can show you what a cart is, a cart is basically just a class with getters and setters, which is in this case an ID and an enumerable of cart items. Let me get back here. So we need to put here logic to check that if the items is null, we need to create a new array in this case. Otherwise, we need to uh, add to a new array. And finally, add to repository. And finally, I added another thing, which is maybe the, the item is in some watch list, and we want to notify people when someone buys that item, or in this case, add it to the cart. So we check that if the item is in the watch list, and then notify. Finally, returning the, the, the result and logging, saying, OK, we if we finished um, this endpoint, we'll retur be returning to the client. So then we have the other endpoints, like update, which has some similar logic, and remove, which again has not exactly the same logic, but also some logic, and mappings and all of that. So everything is in the controller. Hence why I called it the supercontroller. So you probably are aware of the solid principles, not really about the Cupid, which is like a, a play on countering the solid principles, but whatever. Whatever principles you, you know and maybe like or not, are IP. And just a quick aside on principles, while they, are, they can be useful, beware of blinding following them because sometimes they, they can be a little vague and we are following them and not really understanding what they mean. But anyway, because solid is very used in our community, I used it in the examples. So people love to preach solid and you probably have gone to interviews where people asked about solid to you. And then you started working there and you understood that they actually don't do solid, but they ask in the interview anyways. But exactly, is it being practiced? So I won't go into all the letters, but just three of them. So single responsibility principle. If we put everything in the controller, I think it's safe to say no. No single responsibility principle, because one class does everything. Open close principle, which is one of the vague ones, which just means open for extension close for modification. Again. We put everything in the same place. If we want to extend or do something, we need to change the same code always. So it's not closed for modification at all. And the interface segregation principle, which although some people, particularly in C-sharp, think that means that we have multiple interfaces, like interface segregation just means that the public API, like the public methods, don't, we don't have too many public methods that do, don't belong together. So, Again, I think it's safe to say that with a supercontroller, we don't have this. Granted, I don't think the supercontroller is the most common thing that we see, maybe in the past, but now what we see more often, at least in the projects I've worked in, is the super service. And I think you can imagine what's coming next. So if I go to the other project, The controller is similar to what we had, but now we use dependency injection here to inject a card service. And I forgot to say at the beginning, but if you have any questions, interrupt me and ask, please. So we inject a card service, and now what the controller does in all the methods is just delegate most things to the card service and does some final checks either to do some mappings or, for example, to add some try-catch 
to transform some exceptions into, into actual HTTP codes. So this is what the controller does now. But if we go to the implementation of the card service, we can see, if we go through the code, that it's the code that we had before in the controller is basically everything moved here. The only difference is that because we are not no longer in the controller, now we can't return uh, HTTP codes directly. We need to, need to, or I chose to use exceptions. And I'm throwing validation exception and other kinds of things. And in the end, the controller will handle it and transform into HTTP uh, responses. But the rest of the code, as you can see, is exactly the same that we had in the controller. So this, I don't know, you have ever seen code like this before? Like everything, the controller calls the service and the service has everything in there. And basically the methods, the name of the methods in the controller are the same as the name of the methods in the service, so it's basically a replica. It's exactly the same, okay. So I'm not the only one. So back here, I will use exactly the same thing because we are in the same exact place. Are you solid now? No. So this is exactly the same. The only thing that we really changed about this is that we kept the HTTP logic in the controller and all the rest in the service. But, we, but other than that, it's still all in the service. I would even say that this is worse than the other one because if you have a super basic API that we can implement in just a controller with 200 lines, of course, this is sample code. Normally, real code is much as more business logic. But if you have something so simple, just put it in the controller and call it a day. But as soon as we start to do this, I think we just made things more complicated. So let's start. So until now, I was showing basically what I would call anti-patterns, although common anti-patterns. And now let's look at trying to improve things with individual request handlers. So the idea is that instead of having a service that does everything, we'll segregate the service responsibilities and hopefully reap some benefits of it. So back to the code. Don't read too much into the structure of the code and stuff like that. It's just, I didn't put too much thought, even though most of it is kind of like I usually do. But uh, this is a different organization. Not everyone likes this organization. So don't focus on that. Focus just on the other ideas. So the thing I commonly do is create like a static class, for example, with the name of the feature. So this feature that we started talking about is add an item to a cart. So I have a static class with that. And then I have internal classes for the request, the response, and the handler, which is basically the implementation of the service that will handle that feature. So in this request, we have all the information that is needed to implement this feature as an input. So to, we need the cart ID, an item ID, the quantity of the item that we want to add to the cart. As a response, as you, you maybe noticed before, we are returning a 204, so we don't really need to return anything. It's just a success. And then we have this handler. And the handler is basically the service, but just the part of the service for the add item to cart feature. So instead of having all the operations in the same place, we split them into multiple ones. So you can imagine that we also have an handler for the remove item from cart, another handler for the um, update item cart, and so forth. And maybe, I don't know, maybe you already used something called mediator. So Mediator is a library that does something kind of like this, but in other way, I didn't use it. I just wrote pure C sharp code to achieve the same thing. So this handler, as you can imagine, has, all, has the code exactly the same as in the service, but just for this feature. So first advantage, we now have one file per feature. We don't need to always be touching the same code. We just, for example, if two colleagues are implementing two different features, they just have two different files. They don't, they don't have conflicts, they don't have anything. Another thing that we didn't discuss before, but 
maybe it's apparent now, if you are using dependency injection, for example, either you use the super controller or the super service, you'll need to inject in the constructor all the dependencies that might be needed in any of the, the methods. Even though, for example, in the delete, you probably don't need the item repository. You just need the cart repository because you want to delete the cart. You don't need the other one. But because the controller or the, the service did everything, you have no way to know, so you need to always inject everything. So by doing this, you also make it clear this feature depends on this, uh, on, on, on these other features and not you know, on other things that are irrelevant. So for example, if you are unit testing, it's simpler because you just inject what you need and don't inject null things because you know that they won't be needed. This is all still not really object oriented because we are still just doing procedural code. But at least there's no, no more a giant class that does everything. We have split into multiple classes, so it's a win, I think. Not a O, but a win. So one operation, one use case, one class. Clear relation between the dependencies and the use cases. And, and I forgot this part, so let's go back here. So notice that in this handler, we, we have this I request handler interface. And when we inject this to the controller, we have this, we inject the I request handler. So what does this mean is that we have an interface. So it doesn't mean that we have exactly that class there. We can have that class or we can have another thing that implements the same thing. So we can do something here. So I have the interface, which is just this basic thing. I request handler that has a single handle method. And we can implement uh, an object-oriented pattern that you probably have already, already heard of, which is the decorator pattern, which basically has a uh, receives in the constructor. Let me see this. Receives in the constructor the next one. So it's like a matryoshka doll, where we can chain a lot of handlers as long as they implement the same interface. So this is a request handler logging decorator. So I also get a logger. And if you remember that try finally that we had before, I moved it out of the, the other handler and put it here. So now if we talk about the open closed principle, this decorator pattern is an implementation of the open closed principle. We can add features to the handlers without touching the handlers. For example, we want to add logging. Maybe we want to add uh, some observ observ observability thing that, we, that Joanna will talk in the next session. This is a way to do that without touching the business logic that we had in the other class. We just add more decorators. And that chain will call, call, call until it reaches our handler, and then back, back, back until it, re it returns the response. For example, you can also implement caching like this. We, if you have it in cache, we return immediately, short circuit and never call the next handler. Or you uh, call it, get return, put it in cache and return it. So again, you don't need to pollute the logic, the business logic with caching, logging and stuff like that. And that's why I say some typical low patterns emerge, like implementing cross-cutting concerns with decorators. But we can go further and Ideally, what we would really like is for our handlers to not have all the logic, but to orchestrate the logic. Even though, if I have to ask teams to do something, if they go at least here, I'm already happy because it's already not a giant class with everything. But if we really want to do object oriented, then we need to go further. So let's go next and oh, we find. And I start with this tweet. I don't know if you know who Kevlin Henney is, but he's a known consultant that does a lot of presentation in, in big conferences. So I recommend you take a look if you're interested. So he, he said this. He said Pojos, I don't know if you're probably aware, Pojo is plain old Java object. Their equivalent for .NET would be plain old POCO, so plain old CLR object. And here's the important thing. 
POCO does not mean DTO, so data transfer object, which is the common thing that we use to pass data around layers, which are just classes with getters and setters. So it does not mean DTO. It does not mean that the class doesn't do anything and it's just public getters and setters. Or in this case, it is talking about Java. In our case, it's not just properties fully public. public. It just means that POCOs is, are classes that are not tied to a framework by inheritance or by attributes. So we have a POCO and we have DTO. It's not the same thing. It's like DTO is a subset of POCO. And even then, if we take that, uh, what he said to the letter, many DTOs are not even POCOs because they have like attributes saying JSON serializer thingy. And they're not supposed to have th those kinds of annotations to be considered POCOs. But let's ignore that part. So coming back to the root of object-oriented, when object is supposed to be data and behavior, I'm over oversimplifying, probably object-oriented means another thing, but it's close enough. So if all we have and what we've seen so far is that we have data classes, which are those DTOs, and behavior classes, which are those services or that handler that I showed before, we are not really taking advantage of the paradigm. We are doing basically procedural programming in an object-oriented language. So we look at code again, and we'll consolidate the, the logic that we saw in the handlers in classes where it makes sense. So each class represents a concept and exposes it that those capabilities, and forces invariance. So the class itself remains valid and doesn't depend on other classes to make it valid, and also abstracts the rest of the code from its internal details. And the handler will simplify because instead of having all the code, we'll just have code that calls the various objects that do their thing. So as you can see, the handle method now, even with 200% zoom, almost fits in a, in a single window. So it's like less than 20 lines, I think. So the part that gets the card from the repository is the same because yeah, it's, it's the orchestration part that we all, always need to do. But then if you remember, I had some ifs here with that logic of the don't drink beer before midday and uh, don't buy 300, um, 300 beers in one sitting, stuff like that. Now I introduced something weird, which I called the item sale rule repository with a method called get for item, where we give the ID of the item and it will give us a rule, like something that implements I item sale rule for that item. And then if we see here, I would love to not have forgotten the, the shortcut to go back but I did. So if you notice, we get for item, we get the rules, and we just call validate directly. So a few things here. First thing is, what if the item has no rules? What happens here? We'll throw an exception because it returned null. So let's see the implementations. I go here, item sell rule. First implementation which I, I have is a no op or no operation, which does nothing. And this is a, also an object oriented pattern called the null object pattern, which is where you have a, an object that's equivalent to null, but it's not null. So you don't, have, you don't have to spread ifs around your code just to check everything for null. You return something that just does nothing. It might seem wasteful, but it's like, it's, it makes your code much clearer, clearer because, as you noticed, I, it's less four lines that I put before, which would be a if not null, uh, squiggly, um, stuff, chaveta, whatever. <laughs> bracket, yes, thank you. So, and then something in between and then another bracket. So now I just call validate. If it has nothing to do, it does nothing, whatever. I don't care. But if I have something to do, then I have like maximum item quantity. So that if that we had before, now it's here. The minimum time of day, it's also here. 
So you can imagine that this is another way of doing the open close principle. If we have more rules, we just need to add more. We don't touch the add item to cart code. We just add more rules, create new classes, they implement that interface. And of course, in the repository, we'll need to map another thing because probably we'll have a type in the database that we'll then need to map to the actual class. So we'll need to touch that code. But we don't need to touch the update item code. We don't need to uh, the add item code and probably other things that might rely on the same thing. And another thing is what if we have multiple rules? Because we just returned one, we saw that we returned an empty one when we don't want to do nothing. OK, so we can use the same pattern or a similar pattern, another object-oriented pattern, which is called the composite pattern. Maybe you heard of it, which does a for each ins inside. So if there are multiple rules, we'll just create a composite, pass in the rules. But again, the code inside the add item to cart, it's the same. We don't touch it. It's all over here. So if we go back to the handler, so we did the validate. And now we want to add the item to the cart. Again, you see that there's no longer the code to check if the cart is empty or not empty or whatever. We just add the item to the cart. And the cart itself has this logic. So it's now a, a class which has more than just an ID and, a, and the items as public getters and setters. Now we have a constructor that does its thing. The ID is exposed, but the, the, only the get, just for us to read stuff. We cannot set the ID. And for the items, we also cannot set the items. The items is an iRead-only collection that returns these item values, which internally is a dictionary because it's easier to find an item by ID in a dictionary rather than in a list that we need to go through the whole list. So we can use the code as it's supposed to be used, use dictionaries and stuff like that with no issue. And then we have the code for add item to cart here, which is just the code to add the item to the cart. Checks if the item is there. If it is, it throws an exception. Otherwise, it adds the item and returns it. And we also have the code for the update and stuff like that. Because this class now is the cart. It represents the concept of the cart. So it, it enforces that it keeps itself valid and it no longer relies on the handlers to do that. So we'll go back to the cart, do it to the handler, save things. Finally, that if is in watch list that we had that notified stuff, now it also moved. Now we have a listener we call and the listener, we have an interface I post that item to cart listener, which follows kind of the same thing as the I item sale rule. It just, for example, I moved the code to the watch list here. And we moved. And there's also a composite, because maybe you can have multiple listeners. That's a way to have multiple listeners. So it's the same pattern we saw, saw before, so not really relevant to look again. So takeaways of this. And again, don't forget to interrupt me if I say something stupid and you don't understand. It's very possible. So, but takeaways, even better separation of concerns. We already have something nice with the multiple handlers, but now I think it's even better because the handler, it's simpler. The, the, the code is hopefully more readable and cohesive components because we don't have everything, a lot of things in the same place, we split. So now things have a name and they have things, uh, behavior and data associated with that name instead of the behavior being spread. And the handler code now reads like we're reading a, a recipe, like go to the repository, go to the other repository, check if things are there, add to cart, save the repository. Next. So simpler. And also because we created smaller units, now it's similar, simpler to unit test. We can unit test the, the, the cart individually and the, the rules. We can have one or multiple tests for each rule instead of having a ton of tests to check all the variations of the handler. And now the, the test for the handler can be like integration tests, like end to end, and just keep the, because we put the domain logic in the various classes, we can test those. 
and the bonus was the null object and the composite patterns. But one important thing here is that I wasn't just looking to put here as many patterns as I could just to make you go, wow, patterns. The thing is, because I started to use object-oriented practices, the patterns just emerged. So many times, and probably interviews as well, you ask, what patterns do you know? What patterns do you like? And people come up with things, and sometimes in code, they are trying to come up with, I need to come up with some pattern to put here for my code to be better. But the idea is not that you force patterns. The idea is that you use, if you use object-oriented, the patterns will start to emerge. You'll start to notice, ah, OK, I can put that there, because I'm using an interface. Because I, I think many .NET developers started to think like interfaces are, using, are just for dependency injection and mocking. And it's like, I have a big doubt that people that invented interface in like the 80s or 90s or whatever, I don't know, I wasn't here. I doubt they thought about, yes, dependency injection is what the cool kids will be doing in 2015 with ASP.NET Core stuff. Like, no. The interfaces are for other things. The interfaces are for poly polymorphic behavior. So they are helpful for dependency injection and they are helpful for other things like we saw for these rules and stuff like that. So don't just use interfaces for mocking. Use interfaces for stuff. OK, next one. Making use of type safety. This is not object-oriented specific, but it's common in object-oriented languages that are strongly typed. So for example, if you are using Python or Ruby, good luck with that. No, no type safety there, I'm sorry. Maybe you have some annotations or whatever. But other than that, but for example, if you use functional languages or so if you use Kotlin, Java, C sharp, F sharp, uh, what is the Scala, whatever, even if they are not object oriented, they are type safe. But we have this in C sharp, but we don't really use them. So we look at some code again, and we will talk about a thing called primitive obsession that we have a lot. For example, I will use uh, strongly type identifiers, but this applies to more things. We'll use a thing called maybe and nullable reference type. Don't know if you heard about it. nullable reference types in C sharp. It's, it's not new, but it's a recent feature as two or three years. And I will implement something akin to discriminated unions. That's common in functional languages, but we can do something funny with C sharp as well which will help us enforce all expected cases and not be like, I forgot to, to handle that. So code again. Back here, features, add item to cart. So start here. Notice one thing. I don't know if you noticed before, but before a cart ID and the item ID were strings. So one thing we can do when we have a cart ID and an item ID as strings is, and I've done that, you can, for example, pass the cart ID in the parameter that's supposed to be the item ID. Raise your hand if you've done that. Like you have three strings and you mix up the order and do that. You did that? Yeah, we did that. And it wasn't nice <laughs> to discover what was the issue. So instead of having that, we can actually create a type because we are using a strongly typed language, so we can use types with a thought. We can use types to make sure that we don't pass the wrong things in the wrong place. And additionally, besides that, imagine that these IDs are, have some logic. For example, they were strings. Yeah, but you can put everything, anything in the string. So for example, I'll show you a cart ID. Maybe the cart ID was actually a uh, a GUID or a UUID for non C sharp developers, but a GUID for, for us. So we now can enforce that we actually got a GUID. So I created this try parse method. So if it's not a globally unique ID, it will fail. It won't bind because it doesn't respect the constraints of the cart ID. But if in fact it was an item ID, Again, I came up with weird things to show you in the demo. But imagine that an item ID is composed by three digits 
a dash and more seven digits. And even though this was invented by me, you can imagine that maybe you have a barcode. Barcode has a specific format. Or, I don't know, discount codes like a Uber Eats discount codes, which has a specific format. So instead of having validators spread around the code, if you have a strongly typed ID like this, an item ID, with a try parse method like this one, once you are sure that after you create the item ID, everything that you do after, you don't need to validate again. Because if it was a string, maybe you could mix up, so you need to validate again. But by creating a type and having the type, you know it's valid because you created it, it works. Like. So this is the first one. You can no longer mix up the values and you know that after you get them, they are valid because they validate themselves upon creation. Now, the other thing, let me just see what is the other thing. Ah, maybe a nullable. So I'm pretty sure you have code filled with if null do stuff or if null do other stuff. And that's annoying as hell. So one thing, the first thing that I will show you is something called maybe. And the, in some languages it's called maybe, in others are option or optional. We don't have it in C sharp, but we can use libraries or create the type ourselves. So the difference is, if you go to the cart repository, before the repository returned the cart, but it wasn't actually true because it might return null if the cart doesn't actually exist. So we should make it explicit that the cart may or may not exist. So you, the, the caller knows that, okay, I need to check if the cart exists. One of the ways to do this is to use a maybe type, which is just a wrapper. It just means that if you have a maybe cart, you cannot just start using the cart as if you know you have it because you don't know. So what this does is you have maybe a cart and you need to do something to get it. In this case, I used value or. So if I have the, the cart, I put it here. If I don't have, I throw an, an, an exception saying that uh, not found cart. But at least now it's, I made it explicit. I still need to check for null. But because I made it explicit, if I am disciplined and do this everywhere, I don't no longer need to put if null in other places that say that the that cart is actually there because it's there, because I'm saying that it's there. When I'm saying that it's maybe there, then I need to check. So this maybe is a thing external, but there's a recent C sharp feature, which are the nullable reference types, which is where before we could do uh, int question mark or a long question mark or something like that. Now we can do the same for reference types, which are the ones that can be null. So now, if we have actually something that might be null, we can mark it like this. And it's similar to the maybe type. Now the difference is, is this by default, if we enable it, just gives warnings. But I, I don't like just warnings. So I went to the project configuration. So I enabled nullable. And in a thing called warnings as errors, I put nullable. So what happens now? I'm checking for null because I know that it might be null. But imagine that I don't. So if I, no. Can you see the squigglies here? So now I have a compiler exception, a compiler error because I didn't check for null and I'm trying to use something that might be null and I didn't check. So that's why this is good because now everything that might be null is explicitly marked as so. Everything that is not supposed to be null is not. So I don't need to put a bunch of ifs in the code that are not supposed to be there. So I can simplify the code and be explicit in the places that I really need to do something. OK, so final thing here, yeah, discriminated union, which is a 
a weird name. Discriminated union is something that makes us, for example, when we use multiple types, and we want to make sure that we handle all the cases. Imagine like an enum. We probably already done a bunch of uh, switch case on enums, and maybe you have like five five values, and you add a sixth, a sixth, but you didn't add to the switch to handle that, and it won't complain it will just work and then you'll find a bug in production at some point because you didn't handle that specific case. So with discriminated unions we can force to check everything and besides the nums we can have actually things that have more data in them. The nums are just basically ints but we can have more. So what do I mean by this? So if you if you remember I have exceptions that I'm throwing to to warn of stuff. So if I create a new exception, it would, and I forgot to add a, a catch, so I have a, where is it? I have a middleware. I have an exception handling middleware that handles the exceptions. And if I forgot to handle all the types of exceptions, we, it will just give a 500 to the client, and which maybe was not what we wanted. So one thing that we can do, I created something that I call the error detail. And this is where I, I'm doing funny things with C-sharp for it to work, because functional languages do this by design. We need to do trickery. So I have something called an error detail that's an abstract record in this case, which is kind of like a class, and has a private constructor. This means that it needs to be implemented by classes internal to it. And this is the way we force that we cannot create new types that inherit from this from outside. This is one of the ways that we force. This is inside of here. Then I have something weird, which is called a visitor. It's a pattern. I will show you what it does later. But then I have the error details, specific error details. Not found error, invalid error. And now I want to add an unexpected error. If I do it like, um, if I just add it like before, I could forget to, to return it, to, to handle it. But because I'm using the visitor pattern in this weird way, I can do, can do this. If I uncomment this error, this unexpected error, I get a compiler error here, because I'm trying to do, call this visit thing with this, which is the unexpected. But the visit in the I result visitor only gets or a not found or an invalid. So for this to work, I need to put this, I need to also add it. So now I added it. So now I fix these errors. But if you remember the, the code to map this in the middleware, it's this result mapping visitor, which is where I do visit and map this to not found or visit and map this to bad request. And now this is the compiler error. So I'm forced to handle the new case, otherwise it just won't work. And now I fixed the thing, so I had a new case, but the only way I got the code to compile was to implement all the things that I forced myself to do with the, using this strange, but that works approach. And all of this, just to make use of C Sharp in this case, type safety features. So instead of us trying to do everything like ourselves, we are trying to make the compiler help us do the right thing. So avoiding primitive obsession is to get it harder to mix up values than re just relying on primitive types. And we can encapsulate logic there. We also focused on IDs, but it applies to other things, like a common thing is money. We probably use decimal for money. Probably should put inside the type. Maybe it should have the um, currency in there as well, stuff like that. And maybe an IRT forces us to think. So old school null handling is like easy to forget and mess up, but with this we force ourselves to do it. Again, because the type system is helping us. Same for discriminated unions. Granted, I showed you like a hacky approach, but it works.
So let's try to wrap this up quickly with minimize exceptions. And this is, again, not a thing that's specific to object-oriented, but it's more common in object-oriented, and particularly C-sharp. I imagine many of you have the same thing that I have in this sample, which is just using exceptions for everything, like a business logic rule fails, throw. But it's not a good approach. Uh, exception should be exceptional. It's like in the name. So like calling a service and getting the timeout, it's probably an exception because it's unexpected. But the business logic rule failing, it's not. That's why you put like the business logic there, because you are expecting to customers to do something weird, and you need to validate and say, ah, you can't. So what if we made the business logic errors more obvious? And we can do this with return explicit success or error information. So let me try to wrap this up here. So in added item to cart, you'll notice that the code started, it's less linear. That's the biggest problem with this, and that's why it's one of the things that I would like to do, but maybe sometimes I don't do just because of this. Because now you can notice that everything that, my, that could have thrown a domain error now returns an either error or something. And either is a structure that's normally used, again, in functional languages. That's why I say this is object-oriented and some functional in between, where the left is an error and the right is when something goes right. So the difference here is that instead of throwing exceptions, we return. You can see if the cart doesn't exist, we return either left, it doesn't exist. Same for the other, either left. The rules are implemented the same way. They are worth throwing exceptions. Now they return left when there's an error. And that's why we need those ifs to check if it's, a, if it's an error or if it's good. So this is a bit annoying. I get it. But I, f I feel like business logic should be explicit. And ex exceptions are not explicit. Some people call exceptions like a go-to. It's like you are in one place, and you just kaboom everything, and it goes somewhere else. Like this, it's, ex it's explicit. So I won't bother with more of this because it's mostly the same thing. Every time there's an error, it's a left. When everything goes well, it's a right. And because this code will map to a 204, no content, it's, I use something called unit, which is basically void. Just saying it went well, but I don't have anything to tell you. Now, this code is a bit more messy. There is another approach many people probably don't like, but if you are a fan of link, maybe you like. And this is in functional languages called railway-oriented programming, which is where you can see maybe you already, when you, if you use link or if you use like RxJS, this code probably feels familiar. So we just chain all the, the calls. And if there's an error, it will short circuit until the end. So it won't call the other, the functions that we are passing as a parameter won't be called when there's an error. Just go straight to the end. If it's working well, then it calls what's there. Some people don't like this because it's harder to debug and stuff like that. But if you like link, maybe you like this approach and you can like, where's the, and you can use this to make the method much clearer. So let's finally wrap this up. You're probably fed up with me. So the thing was just really handling the errors became explicit. It's no longer like we just throw exceptions and somewhere someone magically works, uh, handles them. And this forces us to think about it because that's the important part. In the business logic, we need to think, what should we do if this error occurs? Because in this case, I just return. But maybe you are in, in a business where if the error occurs, you need to so do something else, maybe to notify someone that an error occurred or to, to put in another system, whatever. So as I said, it's not to replace all exceptions, just focus on business logic. Like a method return receives null when we shouldn't pass null, OK, exception, it shouldn't happen. But if error logic, like in this case, more items, it's normal that it happens. We can return an error. And as I showed you, the downside is that the code is a lot less linear. So wrapping up, 
revisiting this subject reminded me of when I first learned object-oriented programming in, in university and got me thinking because I learned things this way in university. But when I started working, it all went out and we got into the super service territory, which is what I did most of my career. So all these procedural, object-oriented, functional, it's not one better than the other, they are all valid. But just because there's been a lot of hate, object-oriented is not good, we should all do functional. But you are not doing object-oriented, so don't hate what you are not doing. If you are doing and don't like, sure, try the others, they are valid. Functional languages are great, procedural, like Go is great, do it. But do object-oriented right to know if you like it or not. I don't know. Do we even have functional programming anymore or object oriented anymore? It just it's all a blur. It's it's all no. Now we have primarily one paradigm languages that does everything. Like C sharp is primarily object oriented with functional approaches. Like I showed that code with a link that was functional mixed up in object oriented. But then other languages like Scala, F sharp are primarily functional, but then you can implement code like there and yeah, and then unless you go with Haskell, maybe Haskell forces you to do functional. Haskell forces, forces you because it makes you do fu pure functions and poor and pure whatever. So yeah, that that's one. And maybe what's the the other one? Yeah, shut up. Uh, so Haskell is based on what is the other uh, Lisp. So probably Lisp also does that. But, uh, but yeah, they, they are multi-paradigm with a focus on one. And that's why the, the whole presentation, I put object-oriented as the focus, and then I threw functional in there. But the thing was mostly, most of the code is procedural. So don't complain about functional and object-oriented if you are doing procedural, basically that. And maybe if you already heard some of these DDD, CKRS, and buzzwords, and you might think, ah, you are talking about that. No, not really. What happens is that DDD and CQRS and stuff like that basically went down to the basics and most literature about DDD uses object-oriented languages to express itself and that's why it seems like it's a blur between the two things but it's not the same. You can implement DDD with functional and you won't put methods in objects because that's not how functional is supposed to work. And I would even say my code is not following DDD patterns because, for, for example, in DDD, DDD patterns, you, you would use an aggregate root, and you have entities inside that you need to hide, so you, do, you can't just call every entity. So my code is object-oriented, not DDD. But yeah, if some things you might see a crossing because exactly that, because they used object-oriented there. If you're interested in demo code and stuff like that, and probably the folks from the organization can put this in the, then in the meetup, so. And if you want to reach out, I have a bunch of links. And that's it. Thank you. Uh, if you have uh, a super service, mm -hmm. and you need to break it down, where do you start? What are your advices? The breaking the super service is the simplest of the all because you can go to the handler approach. So the, the handler approach is just you grab the code from one method of the service and put it, at least if you don't have a lot of private methods, if you have a lot of private shared methods, then that might be a problem. But other than that, if it's kind of simple that you can just extract that part, maybe if you're starting, copy the code or or move the code to like some static functions and do it like that. That's the easy part because it's just grabbing one method, put in the handler, and start to do that. And it's easy because you cannot, you don't need to do everything at one time. You can just start with one method, move it, then you just change the controller to instead of using the service in that method. I forgot to show you that, but in the controller, in the action, in ASP.NET, you can, there's a thing called from services that I think it's no longer needed, but it was needed. So you can, instead of injecting the handlers all in the controller, you can inject in the endpoint. So each endpoint can declare, I need just this thing. So you can do that. 
So you just change the controller for that method, commit, push, production, like, and then you next, next. The other ones are more annoying because the other ones, you start creating objects and stuff like that. It's harder, but still with refactoring and doing stuff like that. And as I said, because when you start to create the classes, you can put the, you can unit test those classes individually. It starts to get easy because you start to do, move it, test just that, it works, next. But the service is easier. We need to start to isolate the logic and then yeah. convert yeah. it to Android. But it was what I said. I would love for everything to be object oriented, but if you move from super service to handler, it's just a massive win just there. Mm -hmm. So it's not that bad. Yeah. It's better than <laughs> the alternative. <laughs> because this was simple code, so the, the controller or the service were 200 lines. Yeah, but I worked in places where the controller was 2,000 lines. And that's what does and that was a, not the biggest file in that code base. So, uh, yeah. So of course, demo code is demo code, and it seems stupid because in this case, just put everything in the controller. But that's not the real case. I, I doubt you have so simple business logic. Thank you. No problem.